16 and put your finger in there and save that for a little bit later, but Acts 1, chapter 8. What we've been talking about these past few weeks, and this is the third one on discovery. How do I discover not only more of God so that I can be closer to God, but how do I discover what God actually wants? How do I discover how God has actually equipped me to be able to do the things that He desires? And so what we did last week is I passed out homework. And so how many of you did your homework? Alan, you didn't do your homework? No. That dog ate it? <laughs> what an excuse. So anyway, my cat shredded it. Oh yeah, he's a pastor. You can't you can always tell a pastor, but you can't tell him much. So anyway, so yeah, we handed out a gift assessment form, and I don't have any extras here. I have some at home. I'll bring them next week. And you can take this study, and you can take a look at it, and it will help you identify who you actually are in Christ and the giftings and the leanings that God has given you. But let's just go down, and let's review them. And so here we go. Here's the first one. The first one is you might be a prophet or you might be a perceiver. And that's uh, not profit with an F, it's profit with a PH. So there's a difference in the two. And uh, here's some characteristics that you find. You might be able to recognize what is right from wrong. And so you can, you can love what is good and you can hate what is bad. And so I don't know about you, but I was kind of perceptive and prophetic whenever I watched the hearings about Judge Kavanaugh, and I got mad. I mean, I got, Arr! you know, I was going like, good grief. And so then, uh, just at the injustice that was take, being taken place. Some people said that because he had a vigorous defense of his honesty and integrity, that they didn't think he was fit to sit on the bench as a federal judge. I thought, what? I said, this guy's fighting for his professional life, his home life, his everything life, and you want him to be calm and just laid back? Oh, yeah, go ahead and attack me. I don't care. You know, I'll get this in the bag. And uh, so I thought, man, this is good because this guy has a set of principles that he lives by and he's willing to state them and defend them. The next one that we have is a server. And so if you're a server, you already know who you are because you're already doing things without being asked. And that's one of the key things that takes place. So if you're doing things without being asked and you'd rather do it than delegate it, um, that may be an indicator that you have a servant's heart. And that's something that we all need to develop because that was the ultimate trait of Jesus Christ. We talk about Jesus and we talk about servant leadership. The next one is a teacher. And so I don't, I don't know how many of you enjoy studying and gathering more information about giving topics, but that's what you want to do. And you always want to present truth. You want to present biblical truth, and that's truth that remains. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father unless they come through me. So we need to know the truth and we need to communicate the truth. So my messages are probably not as exciting as other people's messages, but my hope is that I equip you through application of God's Word to the everyday life so that you can live successfully for Him. Okay, so the next one we have is we have somebody that's an exhorter or an encourager. A lot of times this is what a coach is doing on the sidelines, hopefully, instead of berating his players. So whenever we encourage other people, that's what we all need to be do, doing, but there are some people that are just tremendous encouragers of others. You find them all the time. They'll be the ones that will come up and will put an arm around you and we'll just say, look, I know what you're going through. I've gone through it myself, and we're going to get through this together. And then they stand with you through it. Or there are others, like it talks about in Hebrews, it says, since we are therefore surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us move on and pursue and run the race toward the goal of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. 
So they're exhorting us, the writer of Hebrews is exhorting us to keep living for Jesus Christ as we can continue going on in life. Giver, this is another category. Sometimes there are, you run into people that just <coughs> give, give, give. And so they don't hold on to things as if it's their own. You know, what they do is they look at it as if God gave it to me, I can give it away, and God will give me more. Mm -hmm. So it's an important characteristic that we look at. And so if this is you, we are glad because you enrich other people's lives, even just by the giving of a card, a letter, a text message, a phone call, or something like that. And so we can see that there are all kinds of great things that happen. These people that are givers, along with the others, will really enhance a ministry. They're not really good on leadership. You've got to watch them because they'll give away everything. And so, um, so they need to be guarded as well because people will recognize that they are givers and then people will go ahead and dump all of their loads and worries and concerns on them. So you don't want to do that. You want to protect a giver. And so they give happily. They don't go, oh, no, do I have to give you more? You know, just uh, isn't 1% enough? You know, just uh, so you got to watch them. Okay, so the next ones that we have, and this is where we get down to some of the other factors. There's two of them here, leadership and administrator. Now, there's a difference between a leader and a manager. And a manager does the right thing does does things right and so if you've ever gone like to a county office and they wanted you to fill out form a b c d e and f and you can't have it until you do a b c d and f then you have run into a manager has anybody ever had that okay how about if you run into a leader a leader, you run into the leader and they got all the forms here and they say, okay, I already got enough information. I'll have my secretary fill it out for you. Come back tomorrow and you can have whatever you want. See, that's a leader. A leader does the right things. A manager does things right. And so sometimes you can't have one or the other. You need to have a combination of both. And so if you have a leader, they can also function as a manager. If you have a manager, sometimes it's hard for them to function and to look outside the box and to look outside the lines. I remember when I was working on military bases doing construction in the 80s in San Diego area, it was always a challenge as to what I was going to run up against whenever I went to get a base sticker for my company truck. How many of you have ever had the challenge of going to a base decal office and getting a decal for your vehicle. And um, one time uh, I had a truck when I worked for this big company and I was uh, overall vi I was vice president of operations. And so I had the main decal here, but then in the San Diego area, you had to have a little strip for every tenant command that was there. So like I had one for 32nd Street, submarine base, Miramar. I had one for Camp Pendleton. I had one for somewhere else and somewhere else. And so I would come up to the gate, and I'd drive up to the gate, and I'd have my white hard hat on. I'd be wearing a white shirt, and uh, I'd come up to the gate, and the gate guard would be scanning all those ribbons, going like, what do I do with you? you know, and I'd just say, hey, it's your rules. i got to have them. Let me in. So they'd let me in. So anyway, so, um, and if you're a leader, you can do things. I found out a long time ago that if you want to go look at a piece of equipment or something else that's going on, if, you, if it's a construction site, if you just put on a hard hat, if you have a tape measure with you and a clipboard and you walk around, you can go look at anything that you want to and nobody will look at it. See, what would happen if you were a manager, you would go check in with the job office. Can I go look at this? No, you can't. Okay, I won't, you know, and so forth. So this is where we sometimes get the idea it's easier to request forgiveness than it is to beg for permission. So we got to be careful about how we operate in the world so that we're operating honestly. Okay, leader administrator. A leader should also be able to administrate, but not be stuck in administration. So if you're a leader administrator, if you scored very highly in that category, you ought to be able to have a day timer or use your smartphone 
as a way to keep track of what you have. You should have a calendar that you operate by so that you don't forget about appointments. Uh, you should have a way to record what you actually do so that it gives you an idea that you have accomplished something because oftentimes you don't see the results. See, that's one of the problems I had whenever I quit doing big construction in San Diego and started being full-time as a pastor at a big church. I could not see any progress in being a pastor. And it really had me puzzled for a long time. Am I being effective for God? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? So then I would find all of these administrative tasks that I needed to do. And I had another friend, Ron Archer. And so we would create all of these administrative tasks that we needed to do so that hopefully we could find a way to be able to observe results. Well, whenever you're dealing with, with humans, oftentimes you can't see the results. And so that's not a bad thing, it's just the way that it works. And so God, unfortunately, has a long haul view and he can see everything. He knows the end from the beginning. And so he can understand where you're at. All we need to do is be faithful in the moment and developing a closer relationship with him. Now, the next one that we have there is mercy and compassion. We should all be compassionate. We should not just be sympathetic. Sympathetic is, I'm sorry that happened to you. Oh gosh, maybe you'll get better someday. Maybe you'll quit doing that kind of stuff to yourself. Whatever it happens to be, that's sympathy. What I'm talking about is being empathetic, okay? That's what Jesus was. Jesus said, okay, I am the way, the truth, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. But if you have faith in me, then I can lead you to the Father. I can give you life. I will send the Holy Spirit. We will watch as great things happen on your behalf. And I will walk with you through this. And even though I'm going back to be with the Father, he said, he said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. We call him the Comforter. We call him the Paraclete. We call him all these kind of things. And he's going to be with you always. He's going to remind you of what I already told you. And he's going to instruct you with the things that you don't know yet. And so, see, that's empathy. See, that's walking alongside of somebody. Even when you don't have to do it, you're walking alongside of them helping them understand the situation, helping bring the resources that maybe you have or even the contacts or the network and bringing them to them. And so that's a true empathy. I understand what you're going through and I will walk with you. That's true mercy. Just giving them a, a, a bag with uh, toiletries in it and say be warm, be fed, be on your way, that's not it, that's sympathy. Okay, so what we need to do oftentimes is we need to walk with people and that's where mercy givers and compassionate people understand what somebody is going through. Don't try and slam them into their own personal mode, mold and yet walk with them through the difficulties of life. Okay? Okay. So how do these things all work together? Well, I came up a number of years ago with, with understanding the great text in the Bible out of Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 16. This is how it's supposed to work. All of these gifts are supposed to help you to grow up. That's something that preachers always like to say. Why don't you guys just grow up, you know? And uh, don't come to me with all that. Grow up, you know? And it doesn't, life to, it doesn't really work that way. Nor does God want us to be treating you that way. So what we have to understand is that God has a plan and a purpose. And here it is in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16. And look at the second part. The second part. Then we will no longer be infants. See, God wants you to grow, and we talked about spiritual growth. We showed the map that showed people going and growing. We want you to be growing up. You know, sometimes we find that there are people that have been chronologically Christian for a long time, but maturity-wise, they're still babies. Wah, you're not feeding me anymore. Wah, I'm not getting fed. Nobody likes me. I guess I'm going to eat worms. <laughs> Grow up. You're not supposed to be an infant. 
Because if you're an infant, you're going to be get tossed back and forth by the by the waves of life. Those kind of things are tough. We can teach more on that, but we're not going to. But what we want to do is we want to build a core of leaders that are in unity. In other words, we're going to the same place with our different giftings, our different graces that God has given us, and we're watching as all of these things come together and the effect is greatly multiplied so that we can help you know Christ, serve our community, and share the good news. And so what we do is we start bringing those kind of things to the front. Now, Pastor Allen does it different than I do it. Diane Valenzuela does it different than I do it. Emma does it different than I do it. Does the differences mean that we're not in unity? Definitely not. We are all headed toward the same purpose. Whenever James gets up here and prays, or Robert gets up here and prays to open the, open the message, what they're doing is they're in unity with me, with others, and we are pushing forward into the kingdom of God. It's very important. And it's not just about doing Bible studies, golf courses, programs, uh, shooting competitions, or anything else. It's about expanding the borders of God's kingdom. So that's what we're here for. So how does this work at Westview? Well, I did this. This is a thing called a mind map. Where's the mind map? That didn't come across. Oh. What? <laughs> it's a blank. Yeah, it came as a blank slide. Oh. oh, man. Well, this is what it looks like right here. <laughs> Let me show you. Oh, I wish you would have told me that. I didn't know it wasn't there. Sorry. Okay, this is a mind map here. And uh, what this is, I'm, I'm really proud of that. I'm humbly very proud of this. And so this is a mind map. And what it does is it shows basically the functions that Westview needs to do. And as you take a look at it, and uh, I'll print some off and have them available next week. But as, no, it's not a flow chart. It's not a flow chart. It has one center point, Westview Christian Center. And then it has all the nodes out here in different areas that people can plug into. Okay, you don't have your glasses on? Okay, so see, here's a mind map. Isn't that incredible? I mean, isn't that gorgeous? See, I did such a good job. Brianna, are you like that? Okay. How about you, Zay? You good with that? Yeah. So, what a bummer. Man, I was looking for this spectacular display of my computing ability, and uh, it never happened. Thanks, Robert. Love you, brother. See there? There it is, right now. Isn't that fantastic? You like the colors? You like the colors? Oh, yes. Yes. Even in my old age, I can do it. See, here's the mind map here. Here's Westview at the center. These are all of the things here that have to do with outreach and spreading the gospel. These are the ways here that we make people welcome. These are the ways here that we do hospitality. So it's really an incredible piece of art. I mean, it's just fantastic. Thank you. See, you can see it right there. Look at all the colors. See, I mean, it's phenomenal, isn't it? Very good. I got the mic seal of approval. See, see there? Isn't that fantastic? What do you think, Junior? Pretty good? Okay. See, Julie? It's lovely. How about you, Natalia? You like that? Isn't that impressive? Wow. I wish I would have come up on this for you. <laughs> yeah. Natalia said it was absolutely fantastic. She'd never seen anything that special. So I'll take her word for it. <laughs> okay. So the next thing that we want to look at, because we didn't do that, is what? Oh. Yeah, we want to talk about power source. Where do we get the power? The power to be able to use the gifts and live out what God has for us comes from God. In Acts 1.8 it says, And He will, the Holy Spirit will, not might. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And so that was for the early disciples and it's for us also. I'm still bummed about the mind map. And so we need to understand how these things work. <coughs> See, my question was to myself as I started crafting this with the help of the Holy Spirit, how can I communicate how, how in my life 
do the gifts flow through? What enables me to be, a, be an instrument of grace for God himself by exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Well, I know that the Holy Spirit comes upon us whenever we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then whenever we go the next step and we say, God, I want more of you. I've got to have more of you. And that hunger inside, then God says, okay, you're getting the whole load. Wham! And there it comes. Oftentimes what happens is we feel a real quickening of the Holy Spirit. We start sensing that there is great things from God. And then we watch as God, does begin, God begins to do great things in us. But then we wonder, is this my human abilities or is this actually God? How do I know? How can I make it work? How can I function according to what God wants me to do? How can I do that? How, what's the mechanism? What are the dynamics? So whenever we look at it, we can look at it and we can figure out how this actually happens. So let's look at the dynamics. In other words, how does this actually happen? So you got to know, first of all, that you have to have a new identity in Christ. You can't operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, experience the Holy Spirit, unless you have a new identity by faith in Jesus Christ. And so if you have that new identity, then the rest will begin to happen to you. You'll start to change. You'll begin to flow. You'll begin to watch as you are able to affect people in a positive way. So here's a couple of scriptures for you. Paul says this to the church in Corinth. Now they had a ton of temples. Okay, we've got a ton of temples here in Utah, right? Okay. He does not say, go find a temple on the hill. He doesn't say, go to a temple that you can only go to if you have a car. What he says was, and we temples... We, we temple builders here, we like cards. Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover. So we like all them cards. But what we're really talking about is we're talking about you. We're talking about you being a temple wherein the Holy Spirit of God resides fully and completely 24-7, 365. Now, how do you let it flow out? You see on a door, a physical architectural structure, you open the doors and let them in. You open the doors and let them out. You do all of those things and you control it through doors and windows. And so what we're talking about with the Holy Spirit is there are certain dynamics and it has to start with your identity. You have to be one of God's children for God's Holy Spirit to talk to you. Now, if you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, you'll find as I walk through this, this is the account of whenever Peter gets a vision while he's at the house of Simon the Tanner, and also Cornelius over in Caesarea is getting a vision from God by an angel that he's supposed to call Peter. So if, if we're going to jump through this in Acts chapter 10, so the first thing that happens is God talks to Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman soldier, and Cornelius was the head of a Roman legion of soldiers, and it may have been his group that crucified Jesus. So as a good Jewish boy, that would have been a problem, right? That would have been a problem. I don't like the Romans. Romans are here in the holy city. This is the place where God said that he would put his he would put his presence and now I got Romans crawling all over this place what is going on God did you forget your promises God answers no you forgot me so here we have one of the hated Romans but this guy is different he's been talking to God in prayer he's been giving money he's been helping Jews build synagogues he's been doing all of these kind of things while still being Roman. He didn't quit the Roman army. He stayed in the Roman army. So, but what happens? God comes and talks to Cornelius, and he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to send a couple of guys to Joppa, 
and I want you to get Peter, who is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. And the Roman soldiers go, yeah, okay, we're going. We trust you. You gave us an order. We're going to do it. So they take off. And meanwhile, we've got like a journey starting here. Now we have a mental journey starting here and a spiritual one because Peter's up on the roof. Peter's praying. Peter is still a good little Jewish boy. He has never eaten bacon in his life. He has never had a cheeseburger because that was not allowed. And so here he is. And so all of a sudden, he gets a vision while he's up there and he's hungry. He goes, I want a BLT really bad. Can I have a, can I have a lamb, lettuce, and tomato? That would be okay. And so God begins to talk to him. And so as God talks to him, he's got to break through Peter's Jewish mindset. And so he has a vision come down, and it looks like a big sheet with a bunch of unclean animals on it. So I imagine there was probably a pig on there. There was probably a, a bird on there that would be un, unclean to eat. There may have even been a lizard. There may have been a rabbit or some other things like that that were unclean to eat. And Peter goes, whoa, I'm a good Jewish boy. I'm not going to eat any of that stuff. And so the thing goes up, and then it comes back down again. It goes up, then it comes back down again. And finally, Peter goes, whoa, three times. There's got to be something significant with this. And so he says, okay. And so he looks, and God says while he's looking at that, he says, Peter, if I say it's clean, it's clean. There is nothing unclean. So therefore, you better straighten up and start thinking the way that I think. And so just as Peter gets through being challenged by God, to change his thinking, which is a key thing for us too, all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. And so as there's a knock on the door, here he goes down there, and there's some guys down there from Cornelius, and they say, are you Peter? And he says, yeah. He says, well, you're coming with me. And Peter goes, yeah, I'm going with you. Now Peter already, in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, has been arrested a number of times, beaten, held in prison, and everything else for only doing what the Master said. So for this, Peter's mind is starting to change as to who he actually is and what he's actually going to do. So now, God has changed Peter's way of thinking. So now Peter goes to the house of Cornelius and if you read it there in Acts 10, it's a great story because his first words are, not, he does not say, Wow, I'm glad to be here with you. I know that God's going to pour out the Holy Spirit on you guys. No, 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 no. Peter says, he's still in the old mindset, and he says, Okay, I'm not supposed to be here because I'm not supposed to be in the house of a Gentile. He actually says that. And then he says, But God told me to be here, so I'm here. So isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? You see, that's totally God. See, that's how we change our thinking. That's how we plug into the power source, is we start changing our mind about what we wanted to do from a human standpoint. So, Peter gives God's good news to everybody that's there. It's the whole family, the servants, a bunch of the, bunch of the Roman soldiers, and he does that. So Peter gives God's good news to them. They all go, wow, we've been waiting for that. And then what happens? The Holy Spirit falls on those at Cornelius' house, which are all Gentiles. Gentiles. You see, they used to, the good Jews would wake up in the morning, the men, and they would say, Thank God I am not a woman or a dog or a Gentile. That's a lot of anti. See, nowadays we talk about anti-Semitism instead of hating Jewish people. Now that, that day and time, the Jews hated us, Gentiles. So it's really kind of a tough thing to do. So there had to be a major, major thought change happen. So Peter's transformation, he comes, he, he engages, and he begins to think God's way, and the Holy Spirit comes in a significant way, 
And so look at here in verses 34 and 35 of Acts chapter 10. It says, so Peter opened his mouth. What's the big deal about that? He was totally relying upon the Holy Spirit of God to tell him what to say. And see, that's where we need to get. We need to get to the point to where for the Holy Spirit to flow through us, whether it's in words or whether it's in actions, we need to wait on God and then do what God says. So Peter opened his mouth and he said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. See the phrase there? I now realize. All of a sudden, I get it. And so it's the same thing with you. It's the same thing with me. You see, what we need to do is whenever we talk about this, we talk about becoming available for God. How am I going to be available for God? I'm not, I, you know, I, I, maybe you're asking yourself, well, I, I'm not the pastor, but so what am I going to do? You see, it's mind change. You have to change your thinking just like Peter did in Acts 10. Read it over again this week. Just look at it. Look at the ways that Peter's mind changes. And you see that we used to resist God, but now, now that we have the Holy Spirit within, we begin to submit to God. You see, we used to allow our emotions to drive our decisions. Well, I don't feel good about that. Well, that's not how you judge something. You go like, okay, factually, let me look at that. Okay, I don't agree with that. But do I need to take it on faith? Because it does line up with Scripture, but I've never experienced it before. So it's not my emotions. You see, the first thing that we have is fact, then we have faith, and then we have feelings. If you're into one-to-one discipleship class, discipleship class with Pastor Allen, you're going to wind up coming to that little graphic there that shows facts, then faith, then feelings. And so we don't do things based on feelings. We may do it based upon perceptions, but you see oftentimes our feelings will get us to exclude other people. So the next thing that we do is my thinking patterns now... I think along Bible lines. If I, if I have a thought that comes into my mind, I right away check it out with Scripture. And if it lines up with Scripture, I embrace it. I act upon it. If it doesn't, I reject it. Okay? That's how we analyze thoughts. That's how we keep from being offended over every little thing. We, we take the things. Is there something in it that's real? So it's my human thinking I need to change my personal agendas and plans. I need to get rid of my preconceived ideas. I need to see it in new ways that are analyzing thoughts instead of doing it the old way. Okay, the other one is my perceptions of other people. How many of you look at somebody else and look at them from the outside and go, boy, they're weird. If you haven't ever done that, raise your hand and then we'll go walk on water. Okay? So you've got to realize that we look at people based upon their past experiences and we make a judgment about their character and their position with Christ. Impossible. You don't know them. You don't know their heart. Only God knows the human heart. Oftentimes I get the thing when somebody passes away and people will say, well, I don't know if he knew God or not. I, I, just, I hope he goes to heaven to be with God. How do I know I just say this. I say, well, our God is a loving and a merciful God. And we don't know what happens within the human heart in the very last moments of life. Jesus was on the cross and there were two thieves. And one of the thieves said, you don't deserve to be here because you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, and he says, you will be with me in paradise this very day. So you see, in the very last moments of life, in the very last moments of suicide, in the very last moments of whatever, we know that God knows, and just because you don't know, doesn't create a large amount of doubt. Now, we can hope, we wish, that they would have started serving Christ earlier in life so that they can experience the full life. Okay, so how do I become available for God? The first thing is I need to start thinking God's ways. 
And so I just need to discover God's plans for my life. That's why we did the homework. We help you discover God's plans for your life. The next thing is, is you got to have your ideas line up with the principles of God's Word. If you're going to get baptized, you can go ahead and go out now and get, get your clothes changed, and we'll do it here in a moment. The next thing is, my thoughts have to compare with God's Word. And so we need to make sure that the way that we think is biblical, because otherwise what's going to happen is we're going to get off the track and we're going to wind up in another place that we never intended, nor did God intend. And so it's an important thing for us to do to make sure that we are on God's track. We are on God's plan. And so as we do that, he says, God says this. He says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Your thoughts aren't my thoughts. But see, we can, by through the Holy Spirit, we can give ourselves and we can start moving towards his thoughts in everything that we do. Why should I love somebody in this community that's of the predominant religion? Why? Because God said for us to love our neighbors as ourselves. He even says, love your enemies. Not just because it'll totally confuse them, but uh, they'll wonder why in the world are you doing this? But because that's the only way that we can reach them. How do we love them? We love them by reaching out to them with love, not condemnation. You see, if you go around and you go, you know, hey, you guys are worshiping a false god, blah, 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 that doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. Instead, if you go, I really love you, and then as you get an opportunity, as time goes on, then you can share with them what that love looks like and where it originated from. So my thoughts have to be compared to God's word. You see, here's God himself talking to Cornelius the Roman soldier in Acts chapter 10. Here he is talking to Peter, the same one that denied Christ three times, the same one that wanted to build a hut on the Mount of Transfiguration. Here's the one that was always brash, but here's the one that also on the day of Pentecost gave a sermon and saw 3,000 people added to the church. So we need to understand that God has plans, thoughts, and ways. Now, haven't you ever gone to the thing and you go, wow, I didn't know you were a Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just looked at their outside character and their way of life and made a judgment about it. You see, what God says is if you do that, then he's going to judge you according to the same standards that you did them. So you're supposed to judge, but you're not supposed to hold them to an artificial standard. And what you can do is once you judge them rightly, and you can help them, you can empathize with them like we talked about, and you can bring them into a fullness of Christ. That's an important thing. The final was i got to have a love for others regardless of my first impression. You always have to walk with somebody a little bit and find out what they're really like. That's your first impression. That's what you get to see. You see, it's just like godly character go along for a ways and then you realize that these people are not who they say they are. Or, wow, I'm glad I discovered these folks because now it's a real joy to be able to be in their presence in so many ways. And so these are just great things that happen as we go along. So Sandy, if you're ready, why don't you come on up and we'll gather up here. Now what we do in baptism <laughs> <clears throat> baptism does not get you saved okay you are already saved and then we baptize you because it's an outward sign of our obedience to Jesus Christ about all of the things that we're going to do in life and we're going to acknowledge that this, that this act is an act of obedience not an act of salvation and so whenever we do that we know that there are great things that are going to happen in our life. Don't wear your boots. I'm not. Okay. Um, God's got his loggers on. So don't wear your loggers, Todd. So, so this is an important thing in the life because it makes a declaration not only to us, but in the heavenly realm itself. And it says that, hey, I am a child of the Most High God, 
and I am obeying God when he said, get baptized and watch as this marker that you create in your life is going to be a great thing to watch as God does great things. And so that's what we're doing here. It's a symbolic gesture. It is not an actual salvation action. It's an obedience action that demonstrates my love for Christ and my desire to follow him. So we're going to do it now, and we've got Todd and Sandy and uh, others later.